So our second speaker is uh, Vincent François Lavé. He's an assistant professor at as, uh, as VU Amsterdam. Uh, he works in uh, deep reinforcement learning. You may know him from his uh, wonderful manuscript uh, called An Introduction to DeepRL. And uh, I think he's also interested in generalization in uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, also, he's actually the organizer of the last edition of uh, RLSS. And uh, I don't think I can overstate this, but after organizing uh, this with a dozen of people, uh, it's quite impressive that you managed to pull this off uh, more or less alone uh, last year. So thank you again for that. And, uh, and now the floor is yours. OK, great. Thanks a lot for the, intro for the introduction. So it's nice to be here for, for this uh, next edition of uh, the Reinforcement Learning Summer School. And today I will talk about function approximators and in particular deep learning uh, in reinforcement learning. So basically, uh, I will give you the basis of what you need to make a deep reinforcement learning work. And this afternoon you will have a tutorial where you can actually put this in practice. So here is the outline of the talk. So the first 10 slides more or less will be really basic things and I will cover that very quickly, not to bore you too much. If you have any questions, just stop me. Um, then we'll dig into how we can actually use deep learning as a function approximator. Um, we will look at all the different variants. So basically, in this part, we we'll look at deep Q networks that you probably have already heard about. And in this part, we we'll look at some variants of these uh, deep Q networks. Then uh, some people say that you know deep reinforcement learning is only used in some toy environments, that it's not useful, and those kind of things. So. We'll discuss some real-world examples of deep reinforcement learning. And then towards the end, uh, we will discuss some, um, uh, some other topics about generalization and some links with upcoming tools like representation learning and model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, but basically, the most part of this talk, uh, as we will uh, see, is um, model-free uh, deep reinforcement learning with deep learning as a function approximator. So uh, as you probably all know by now, um, Deep learning has been able to use, uh, reinforcement learning has been able to leverage deep learning to improve generalization and to tackle complex problems uh, like games, Atari games, game of Go, game of poker, even real time strategy games that are very complex with very long time horizons, huge action space, um, huge state space as well. And then there are um, a growing number of real world applications as well with reinforcement learning thanks to the use of deep learning. So here, uh, you see what you probably all know, uh, a deep reinforcement learning agent that has been trained from the pixels. Um, and that's basically um, uh, using, using deep learning as a function approximator. And this is kind of the thing that you absolutely need to have some generalization and to be able to play these games because then uh, you do not need to have seen exactly the same frame in your training um, uh, set. Uh, to, to generalize to slightly new situations, and that's how you can generalize thanks to deep learning. Okay, so basically the learning algorithms in reinforcement learning may include one or more of these components. The first component that a reinforcement learning algorithm can use is uh, the value-based approach, where we estimate the value functions uh, that pr provide the prediction of how good is a state or a coupled state action. So in the case of a state, it's the V value function. And in the case of the coupled state action, uh, it's the Q value function. So that's the value-based approach. Uh, another approach that is also model-free is a direct representation of the policy. Uh, usually, we write pi of s to denote a deterministic policy that outputs a given action in the action space. Or we uh, denote pi of sa to denote a probabilistic um, uh, distribution over the action space. So here we have a stochastic policy that for a given state will take uh, some action uh, from a distribution. So the, these two are model-free approaches because uh, from experience with model-free, we can directly act in the environment. By, when we know the value um, function or the Q-value function more part in particular, or when we know the policy, we can directly act in the environment. And then another set of uh, approach is called model-based approaches, and then they usually work uh, with planning. And when you know the model of your environment, you have not finished the job, you still need uh, an additional um, step, which is uh, either planning or relearning in some ways the value and the policy based on the model. 
And these, these approaches, these kind of more indirect approaches are called model-based, and we'll only uh, talk about that towards the end of the lecture. Uh, so we will focus here on value-based approaches, and in particular, uh, with deep learning as a function approximator. Uh, yeah, and you see here that you can also combine the different approaches, but yeah, again, we will focus uh, for most of this talk on the value-based reinforcement learning. So uh, you already know this, the expected return, V pi of S, uh, takes a state as input and give a, um, a real number as output, and it denotes the expectation of the sum of future discounted uh, rewards. So the further you are in the trajectory, the more discounted uh, the rewards are, and you start in a given state S and you follow policy pi. So that's the V value function. The Q value function is more or less the same, but instead of directly following policy pi in state S, First, you take uh, action A, and then you follow policy pi. And then, otherwise, it's still the sum of future discounted uh, rewards in expectation over the future trajectories. And the good thing about the Q-value function, which has already been recalled already uh, in, by Erker and also from previous slides, from previous talks, um, you, you get um, from the Q-value function, you, uh, the optimal Q-value function, you can directly derive the optimal policy. Okay, so uh, from this uh, Q value function, uh, basically, uh, the, where the definition is the sum of this future discounted rewards, you can rewrite it by making the Q value function itself appear here uh, in the definition. And basically, you have a, a recursive definition of the Q value function, right? So here, you just take the immediate reward out of the sum. So for gamma equals, uh, for K equals zero, you have gamma equals uh, gamma exponent zero, so this is one. You just take the RT out of it, and then the sum starts from one to infinity, and then this sum can be rewritten as the uh, Q value function uh, starting from an action that follows the distribution pi directly uh, at time, uh, starting from state uh, at time t plus one, right? So, and this uh, recursive definition of the Q value function is basically at the basis of the Bellman iterations. Uh, and you can, in particular, uh, try to uh, fit uh, these Q value functions, not for any policy pi, but for the optimal policy uh, with, uh, with this. Uh, and basically, that's what you use for, for the Bellman iterations. Um, and we have nice properties in the case of a finite MDP, uh, because by applying this update rule from the Bellman iteration, um, we converge to the optimal Q function as long as uh, we uh, have some learning rates that are big enough throughout the learning while decreasing fast enough. So that's basically what this condition is. Okay, so the sum over uh, the different time steps of the learning rate should be infinity, but the squared of the, the learning rates, when you sum them over all the iterations, should be less than infinity, should converge. Uh, so basically, the learning rate should still decrease sufficiently fast to have this condition. Um, and the second condition, uh, be, besides the learning rate, is that your exploration policy should be explorative enough uh, such that you can uh, basically visit an infinite number of times every state action pair in your environment. So in the finite uh, MDP setting, finite, uh, finite uh, state space, finite action space, we converge. So that's great. Uh, but uh, in many cases, we cannot um, work with a finite MDP. And why is that? Because for large-scale problems, we have what is called the curse of dimensionality. So for instance, if you take a robot with about 10 features for the state, uh, and you want to discretize each feature in 100 bins, you already have uh, about 10 uh, exponent 20 states, uh, which is already becoming prohibitive. Uh, if you look at chess or Go, uh, you, are, you have even um, more states. Uh, so you have three problems, basically, memory problems, compute problems if you want to, to work with the finite MDP setting, and uh, even maybe more importantly, you have no generalization in the limited data context. So you really need to have your agent to visit every state action pair in your environment, uh, and that's, that's not what you want. So because of these three problems, you need to go beyond these tabular approaches. So let's move on to function approximators. Any question? I guess, hopefully, I've not taught you so much 
for now, you are still fresh for the next part. Okay, great. So, functional approximators, what are they? Well, a functional approximator in general uh, is a function that takes as input uh, some x and gives as output some y. And it is parameterized with some theta uh, belonging to um, the, 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 the vector, basically, uh, of size and theta of and a vector of real numbers. Um, so we can write it like this. So basically, it takes as input x, and it also takes as input the parameters theta, and usually, we denote, uh, I mean, one notation that is common is to have the theta that are after the uh, semicolon, such that the theta are clearly the parameters of the function approximators, and the x is the input, right? And so you can have, like, for instance, linear function approximators with the uh, purple line here. So even though your true function that you would like to approximate is like this, uh, if you have a linear function approximator, well, you will never be able to, to do better than this. And then, for instance, here in this case, we show uh, different polynomials. And when you increase the degree of your model in, in, in your polynomial, then you can get a better accuracy, but you also have some risk of overfitting. So here is an example in the supervised learning context. Um, so the different types of functional approximators. So for instance, you have linear functional approximators. They are nice because they are differentiable. Uh, and in a very simple form, as, was, uh, as it was explained by Erke, in the pre previous talk, uh, but they are not so flexible. So basically, we cannot uh, target very complex problems when we use um, linear function approximators. And then you have a whole bunch of other techniques um, for function approximators, such as SVMs, tree-based approximators, etc. They are more or less flexible, um, but they have one drawback. They are not differentiable, right? And basically, neural networks uh, are both flexible and differentiable. And maybe these two characteristics could actually somehow, uh, um, it might be a bit controversial, but uh, could actually be what defines what a neural network is, right? Okay, usually you have this kind of deep learning architecture where you have to speed forward and this back propagation and those kind of things. But basically, as long as it is differentiable and, uh, um, and flexible, people might want to call this uh, a neural network, right, nowadays. So it's a bit controversial, but um, Basically, um, as long as you have these two, these two uh, characteristics, then you can do nice things. OK. Um, and yeah, so what you can do is basically bring the generalization capabilities of these function approximators to reinforcement learning. Uh, so gradient descent, I guess you all know that. But uh, just a very quick recall about that. So you have uh, an objective function, g theta, for instance, and then you basically start with some uh, random initialization of your parameters theta, and you move these parameters in the direction opposite to the gradient uh, g theta. So you calculate uh, the gradient at each uh, iteration, and then you move in the direction opposite to the gradients with some learning rate alpha k, and you update the parameters theta that way such that you uh, minimize your objective function g theta. So that's, that's gradient descent, and it requires your objective function to be differentiable so that you can move, of course, with gradient descent towards optimizing your objective function. Um, OK, so now let's get into um, actual, actually using deep learning uh, in, in the context of reinforcement learning. Any questions so far? No? OK. So let's get into deep networks. So what do we want to do? Um, we, we have we want to approximate these Q values, right, with uh, any given state and any given action. And so here it could be uh, any pi, but in practice we will aim for uh, learning the optimal uh, Q value function. And um, to parameterize these Q value functions such that it generalizes, we use function approximators, which is basically kind of um, shown by this. We use parameters theta that are the parameters of the neural network that represent this Q-value function. Um, so basically, it takes as input S, A, and A, and uh, depending on the parameters theta, it will output some, some, some values, right? And in particular, in the Q-network, instead of giving S and A as input here, uh, 
we, we usually give just the state as input and provide an action for each different um, uh, finite uh, action at the output, right? And you can do this with a if you have a finite number uh, NA of actions. And that's what deep Q networks are based on. It's based for kind of any continuous state space, but uh, a still a finite number of actions. So that's what we will look at uh, for now. Um, and the good thing about this structure of the Q network, instead of putting SNA as input, is that from one feedforward path in your Q network, you get all the Q values at the output, so that when you want to, do, to look at the argmax, for instance, uh, well, you, you just have them uh, right away in one path. You don't need to, to go um, to a, a path in your Q network for each possible action, which you would need to do if you give the state and the action as, output of, as input of the Q network, right? So you give the state, and then you get directly all the Q values for all possible actions. Um, and so what do, what do we do? Uh, well, we use um, basically the semi-gradient update. So we start with parameters theta, and we move in the direction opposite of this gradient of the objective, where the objective is the square of the difference between the current estimates of the Q values for state action pair SA and the target. Okay? And the target is the one-step look-ahead expected return. So that means we look at, for a, a tuple state action reward next state, we look at the reward plus gamma and the uh, maximum expected return that you can get from the next state onward. So it's kind of the one-step look-ahead uh, expected return that you can estimate from uh, the, the information state action reward next state. Um, and that, that is your target. Uh, and basically what you try to do is get your Q values close to the target by minimizing this uh, objective. Uh, with gradient descent via the parameters theta that parameterize your Q value function. Okay, yes, question. A uh, quick question. Um, for the target, you are using the argmax action. Yes. And how come like the Q value of the argmax is up used to update all the actions in the neural network? OK. Um, so you do not modify the, uh, you try to modify the Q values here only for the given state action pair, right? But here, for the target, you indeed look at the max over all your actions at the next state. But here, you only say explicitly, I want to minimize, so for one, so if I go back to the previous slide, so for instance, let's say that it's the second action that you, that you took in a given state S, right? You will want that this value outputted by your Q network will get close to the target that can, depends on the reward and the next state you end up in. So you only, modif you only try to modify for this given state and action pair, but here you look at the max over the whole action space. Any other question? And yeah, and it, so, so, it, so it might be that actually by modifying this, since you optimize the parameters theta, it might be that you also change the values over the other actions, right? But that's not what you explicitly try to do. And, and then, um, then you, of course, also need to, to have visited at least sometimes or to be able to generalize over your rule action space, uh, right? But then you get that information from other tuples. OK, so why do we use the squared loss? So basically, you already had a lot of theoretical information about the semi-gradient parts uh, by Erke, and he also gave like, the information about what the, the, the derivative of this squared loss gives you and how, where it converges. But w why is the least square error useful? This is really a kind of a very um, 
very general question, right? It's not only for reinforcement learning. Why is there a squared here, right? We could have uh, maybe exponent three, why not? We could have no exponent at all, why not? It's strictly positive. Um, it's strictly positive, uh, yes, but it's not, yeah, for instance, if you take exponent four, then maybe at least you would have the same thing, but that's not what you do. Probably convex. Yes, yes, that's definitely an advantage, but again, if you take, uh, well, yeah, but again, for instance, if you take uh, exponent four, it would be convex in the same sense than what you say, right? Yes, yes, it's getting closer. The gradient is directly proportional to the distance. Uh, the gradient is? Directly proportional to the distance. Um, yeah, so yeah, it also, uh, it also, it's also due to this, yeah. So basically, the, the, the reason why, it's because by minimizing the mean squared error, we basically converge this to the distribution's mean, right? So for instance, if you have, if you try to optimize C to fit uh, this expectation for uh, samples Y taken uh, from the distribution of the random variable big Y, right, and you minimize this, your C will be equal to the expected value of Y. So for, with some uh, a, a simple example, so if for a given state action pair SA, 20% of the time you get a reward of one and a terminal state, 75% of the time you get a reward zero and a terminal state. By minimizing this with the squared error loss, okay, from, from the samples uh, of, of this distribution, then you will fit Q of SA equals equal 0 0.25. And that wouldn't be the case if you take exponent four or exponent three or anything like this. So if you take exponent four, what would C be? Uh, if you take exponent four, uh, C will, uh, will not be 0 0.25. It will likely, um, um, yeah, so, so basically it will penalize more the big errors than the small ones. And so basically it will want to be closer to the reward of one here, because even if it only happens 25% of the time, it will want to be closer to 0 0.5, because uh, a 0 0.75 exponent four is way bigger than 0.25, the error that it gets here if it was at 0.25, exponent four, so right? I, I mentioned that general case of some y. Uh, what do you mean exactly? So like for exponent two, if you see C can be equal to the expected value of y? Yes, exactly. So for four? Yeah, so for four it will not be, uh, it will be equal maybe to some kind of other statistics of the random variable wide, but at least not the expected value. And not, yeah, yeah, higher moments. And, and not, the, not the, the expected value that you're interested in. Uh, and that's, that, that, that's what you want to have, right? You want to have your Q values to be the uh, optimal expected value of the return, of the discounted return. And that's why the, 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 we have the square. Okay, so now let's see um, how we, we do this in the, in the deep Q networks. Because here, so we have this equation uh, that is basically um, what, what, what I've just explained, but there are many matrix that are important to bring in. Why is that? Because as Erke mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, as soon as you have nonlinear function approximator, and even though you use the semi-gradient that, that is important uh, in this case, to, to convert to something meaningful, with nonlinear function approximator, you will, um, you will have a risk of divergence, or at least instabilities, right? So you have to bring some specific tricks to learn as best as you can, uh, even though you are in the complex case of off-policy learning, um, a function approximators that is nonlinear. Uh, so you need to, to make sure that even in that case, you are able to, to learn from, um, uh, to, to learn effectively. So uh, in deep key networks, there, there are a few, uh, there are two, two key things. The first one is to use uh, a replay memory. So basically, 
you keep a large uh, buffer in, of information uh, of previous state action rewards and next states, right? And you put them in your replay memory. That allows you to keep like a broad range of information that you acquired in the environment. Uh, and then from that, you sample mini batches from which you learn the updates of your Q values based on the, the, the rule that we saw earlier. So you, first thing is you keep a large replay memory of your past transitions. You sample from them to calculate uh, this update. That's, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is you use a target network. So not only uh, you use the, this ID of the, uh, of the target that is, not, that is kind of uh, fixed in the sense that you use some gradients, so you do not update the theta here when you uh, minimize this objective, but not only do you do that in the deep Q networks, but also you actually um, freeze the target network for a longer number of iterations. Uh, and uh, this uh, constant C is usually, for instance, uh, 1,000 iterations or 5,000 iterations uh, on, of, of that order. And basically, for that number C of iterations, your target here is kind of fixed, right? So it's kind of similar to fitted Q iterations, right? Before you have ever updated um, the theta, for instance, if you start with uh, Q values that are initialized with more or less zero everywhere, well, at, the, at first, you will only fit the immediate rewards. And only when you update after C iterations the neural network will you try to fit the immediate reward plus the reward at the next time step that is given by your Q network that you have updated one time, right? So it's kind of the idea, but the thing is that you do not wait before fitting completely either the, the, the Q value function. So it's kind of um, using a target network that, that is kept fixed for, for a given number of iterations and updated uh, every C iterations, right? Is it more as clear, these ideas of target network? So basically, you keep, um, you kind of make a copy of your uh, neural network Q that you keep fixed for C iterations and you use this in your target, right? So that's why we get theta minus here that uh, clearly emphasizes that this is a copy from a previous neural network that is kept fixed for C iterations. And these two uh, elements uh, were, were the key for uh, scaling the deep Q networks to the Atari games um, in the 2015 papers. Um, okay, now let, let's see what it looks like when we apply deep Q networks in a very classic um, environment, such as mountain car. So I guess many of you already know this example. You have um, a car that needs to go uphill, and it, it cannot do it in one go, so it needs to go a little bit forward, a little bit backward, and then it, it gets up the hill. And what we can look at is what DQN does when you try to fit the, uh, the value function. So here we have the two features that, uh, that, um, that form the states, so the position and the speed. And then in the Z axis, you have the V value function. And what you see in the video is the process of learning this V value function through time. And what you see is that here, even though we use uh, a replay memory with some, um, with some mini batch and that we use a target network, you see that there are already some instabilities, right, in the learning. Um, and, and in the end, it converges to something pretty close to the optimal Q values. Um, but if these instabilities are worse than what you see here in this learning process, if t t they are worse than this, then you will have complete divergence in your, in your learning uh, algorithm, right? Or you can keep some bad instabilities that will uh, lead to a policy that is never really good, right? Uh, so you need to be careful about the stability. That's why uh, at least the two things, uh, replay memory with sampling in mini batch and target network are important. Um, and then once you have learned 
this V value function. So basically here, the V value function is just the max over the action space of the Q value functions that are actually learned uh, in the DQN uh, algorithm. Once you have learned this, well, basically you can also, in this small environment, because the, there are only two continuous features, you can also visualize uh, the solution. So basically you start uh, from position zero and speed zero, and then basically by following the, uh, the actions that every time corresponds to uh, the max over your Q values, you will uh, follow the optimal policy and you will get up the like this. Okay, but so t these were kind of more or less the basic things that were um, introduced in, in deep reinforcement learning to, to make the learning um, fine, but there are many other tricks that, um, that we will cover uh, today. But any questions so far? Yes? Yes. So for instance, uh, let's look at, uh, I don't know, maybe position minus one and speed maximum, and maximum speed. So we can look at this point, right? So here it's more or less at the final value where we can uh, estimate that it has converged. But if you look through, uh, through the learning, you will see that it's, so it needs to go towards the correct value, but sometimes it even overshoots and then goes a little bit too low and then a little bit too high. So these are the instabilities, right? So it's not only that you need to wait for some iterations to converge. It's like in this process of convergence, you will go a little bit too high, a little bit too low. And these instabilities are kind of propagated towards the, um, the updates, right? Because if you make an error, for instance, here, then if, if uh, from that state and a given action, you end up here, well, that, that error is propagated to uh, those Q values as well, right? And this, this is the effect of the instabilities. And these instabilities are also getting worse um, when you have a high discount factor, right? So basically, if you have a discount factor of zero, that's the extreme case, right? You're only fitting the immediate reward. Basically, you cannot have any instabilities. It's just supervised learning, right? And when you bring this this factor higher and higher, you have more and more instabilities. Any other question? What's the value C? The value C? Yeah, C in the algorithm. Oh, uh, the frequency of the uh, target. Network. Oh, yeah, so here it's uh, probably 1,000 iterations. Any other question? No? Oh, yeah. I know that instead of the maximum operator, you can take an expected value over the next Q values. Could that make the learning more stable, or how would that influence the learning? So, so here you, you are trying to um, converge towards the optimal Q values, right? So that's why you have this max a. So if we, um, yeah, so, so, so you take the, basically you take in a, in a sense the expectation because you have your tuples. Every time you take a given, um, well, this is not the right equation. Well, yeah, but isn't this a larger variance sampling of that expectation. Couldn't we just make a sum weighted by the policy values over all the possible next states? Um, oh, okay. So basically, what, what, yeah, so what you try to have is this part, right? Yes. So, and you try to fit this um, in expectation, this one step look ahead when you uh, are given state S and when you take a given action A, right? And then you look at uh, over all these tuples basically uh, that start with SA, you look at the rewards you obtain and the next state you end up in, and you calculate this expectation and that's what you are trying to fit basically with these uh, semi-gradient updates with the Bellman iteration. And you do it in the specific case of the max over the action space because you don't want to um, converge towards any policy Q pi, you want to converge towards Q star. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Yes, sure. Yeah, so, like, I had a question. So, when you have a replay memory of, as you said, say, size 32, right? And so the mini batch size, yeah, mini is batch size, 32. yeah, well, yeah, well, but then like the mini batch is selected statistically randomly, right? So the samples that are not selected in the mini batch uh, are they discarded or? Uh, no, so yeah, so yeah, thanks for the question. So um, you keep a large replay memory, uh, and basically every tuple that is in the replay memory ends up uh, several times, at least in expectation in these updates. So basically, uh, every, at every step, you would store uh, one tuple state action reward next state in your replay memory. And at every step, you will also do an update based on a mini batch taken from the replay memory. So, you, so usually, uh, uh, for, for the vast majority of the tuples stored in the replay memory, they will be uh, sampled several times for these updates. So they are reused several times for the update. And that's also an important part for the sample efficiency, right? You reuse several times every tuple that you have observed. Other questions? Yes. And in the replay memory, do you keep all data always, even if the training is very long, or do you discard some data over time? Um, when the training is very, yeah. very long. So uh, usually in the replay memory, you will have a finite size still for the replay memory, maybe one million tuples. Uh, and you will maybe use something like FIFO, like first in, first out. Uh, no, uh, uh, first, first in, first out, yes. So basically, the oldest tuples will be out the first. Right? Any other question? So, and basically, you will also have the opportunity to actually, I think, implement exactly this uh, deep Q network during the practical session. And I think you will also have a recall of all these aspects uh, during the, the afternoon session. Um, and in the, the uh, second part, let's say, of this uh, presentation, uh, we will look at kind of um, yeah, the, the additional things that you can look at to improve further deep Q networks. Uh, um, so that's, that's what we will look at. And first, we start with the right deep learning architecture. Uh, so there is a whole um, set of potential modules that you can combine to make up a neural network. Um, this is true for any field of machine learning, like supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Um, and it's also true for reinforcement learning. So let's just look at uh, a few of them. Uh, for instance, when you work from images, Usually, you will work with conventional layers because they are really good for kind of introducing the right inductive bias um, and learn efficiently. So you will usually combine, and that's basically what the DQN paper uh, did. Uh, so they use conventional layers and then fully connected layers uh, to learn the, the Q values. Um, if you have a PMDP, so for instance, you have a, a hidden dynamics, and at every time step, you only get uh, an observation from the state, uh, and based on these observations, you need to, to, make, to take some actions and you get some rewards, etc. But basically, the true states are hidden. Uh, then in that case, because you need to take into account uh, a whole history of observations, actions, rewards uh, for kind of a pseudo state, uh, so basically it becomes a time series. Uh, usually, re recurrent neural networks uh, uh, work well, but you can also use CNN, even though there are some some specific advantages um, for, for Ireland. Um, then you have um, the, the transformers architecture, right? So if you have heard about, and I guess you all do, have heard about systems like ChatGPT or many, many um, state-of-the-art algorithms, uh, they use transformers architecture. And in reinforcement learning, it has also been used. In particular, in this uh, Gato paper, they use um, they learn policies kind of separately for many different domains. And then they used one big uh, transformer architecture to learn tasks that are from different domains, like image and questions answering, 
uh, images and proprioceptions for robotics tasks that are initially learned with robots, Atari games that are initially learned with, uh, with reinforcement learning. Um, you have also text-based games. And all of these are then kind of distilled into one big transformer architecture that kind of uh, tells you what action you need to take for any of these potential inputs, right? And the goal is to kind of create something that is kind of more, more of a generalist agent. And um, yeah, so a transformer is a deep learning model that adopts the mechanism of self-attention, uh, differentially weighting the significance um, of each part of the input data. But I will not go into the details of what a CNN is, what, a R, what RNN is, uh, what, uh, what transformers are, et cetera. Um, any questions? Yes. About the DQN stuff we looked at previously, um, when we sample from the replay buffer, yes. we're doing that randomly because we're assuming that these are independent uh, and identically distributed, right? Yes. But um, we also, as time goes on, we remove samples from the buffer and we replace them with new ones. Yes. Doesn't that kind of um, break our IID assumption in the long term? Um, so, so the idea with deep key networks and Q learning actually in general is that basically it is of policy learning. So the goal is to be able to learn from any of policy data. So in that sense, ideally, you would be able to learn from more or less any distribution as long as it covers your root state action space. Uh, but indeed, um, kind of the kind of information you keep in your replay memory can have an impact on how efficient your updates are, right? For instance, yeah, if in your replay memory you only keep, uh, I don't know, the very last transitions that are obtained with a very bad policy that is not exp well explorative, for instance, right? Then you will not be able to do nice uh, queue updates either, right? But fundamentally, I think the most important is the goal with queue learning is to be able to learn from any of policy trajectory. So even if one million steps before, your policy was very different than the current policy uh, provided by your Q network. You are still able to make some use of these tuples. Yes. The importance weights. Yeah, so, so here we use the semi gradient updates with the Q-learning rule. So it's not indeed kind of the full gradient possibility that you can have, but it's the semi gradient, right? So maybe I can add some things. Um, so if you do, do Q-learning, there's two actions involved, right? So there is like the action which you're updating, right? Which state action pair you're updating? There's an action that, that okay. comes from somewhere. Oh. There's two actions involved. You're updating a certain state action pair. So you have that action, let's say the A at time sub T. And you also have the action at time sub T plus one, which is in the target, right? Um, now, what you would do with importance weighting is not correct for the visitation frequency. So not for like the distribution of which states you're updating or which state action pairs you're updating, but you're only correcting for um, the um, action that you're taking uh, in the target. Um, and in uh, Q-learning, the action that you're learning in the target doesn't come from the behavior policy like it does in um, uh, like it does in Sarsa. So the action, uh, w which action you plug in for the target, it's already this maximizing action, which is also your target action. So that's why you don't have to correct. Yes. Um, or right, sorry. Uh, for like Q learning or DQN, um, can you make it multi-step? So or like use some kind of like TD Lambda scheme? Yes, yes and we will look at this oh. in the coming slides. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's that's indeed. Um, so basically, here we looked at uh, different uh, deep learning architectures, and then um, 
Basically, here is what we will cover for the coming slides, and one of these is multi-step learning. Yeah. Any other question? So, like, I, yeah. so has there been any investigation on the distribution that you use to sample the mini batches? Like, if you do it, say, uniformly versus, I don't know, like, we give more weight to the recent samples or something? Yes. Uh, so, there has been some work about that. One of these is prioritized experience replay, which actually I do not cover today because uh, of lack of time. Um, but you can indeed try to find smart ways of um, sampling the tuples from the mini batch so that you make the learning more efficient. Yes. Uh, for either by trying to maybe use more of the recent tuples or by looking at the ones that have the biggest Bellman error. And then you try to sample these more often. But when you do this, you must also be careful because, uh, yeah, there might, there might be some drawbacks, but this is definitely useful in some settings. Yes? Uh, is there a way uh, to be selective with the most informative trajectories? So in order to have the stability of uh, uh, that you talked about in the previous slide, so, um, if there is a framework that uses some regression sampling in order to pick only informative trajectories so that there is not this variability that propagates? Well, um, yes, so you, you can try to indeed keep only the most informative tuples in your replay memory. If you get a tuple that is already maybe somewhere in your replay memory, you could try not to put it in the replay memory. So there could be some ways to do that, but this will not completely solve or not actually uh, aim at reducing the instabilities directly. It would, it would aim at having, I mean, yeah, somehow it could potentially help as well, but uh, it would aim at kind of at getting a better coverage of your root state action space of interest. Um, yeah, so, so basically, yeah, you're trying to, to get the most informative tuples in the replay memory, whether it is by exploration exploitation or by also maybe some more selecting um, how you s samples from, from this uh, replay memory can be useful. Okay, so now we will look at um, these different things. So, um, so, so, so these are all different techniques that have been used uh, su successfully to kind of improve the learning uh, on kind of on top of, of deep Q networks. So basically we are still um, for now in the model free value based, Q learning based uh, uh, results, except distribution IRL which cannot be fully called Q learning based. We'll see that in a moment. So double DQN, the goal of double DQN is to uh, decouple uh, two different things. So um, when we look at uh, the usual uh, DQN update, we calculate the maximum, the, the best action, um, and we take the estimate of the best action from the same target network, right? But you could do take, and that's what the double DQN does, take the best action based on this target network that you have frozen, but then use that best uh, action uh, for, for, uh, by, by using the, the value that is actually given by your current Q network, right? So you kind of decouple the selection of the best action and the estimation of the Q values at that best action. And by decoupling these um, this, uh, these two things, you, uh, uh, you you can improve performance further as compared to DQN. So basically, you kind of um, thanks to this, you kind of reduce the overestimation bias that appears in Q learning, and you, you reduce the instabilities and the risk of divergence. So this is called double DQN, um, and it has been applied successfully. Uh, on top, basically, of, of DQN. Okay, so more, more stabilities, uh, better stability and improved learning when you use uh, double DQN. So that's one way to, to, to try to, to, to improve further um, the, the DQN algorithm. Um, multi is it clear? Okay. So multi-step learning, so that was the question uh, from five minutes ago. Uh, in the usual DQN, we use the one-step look-ahead target, right? So we look at, for a given state action pair, 
we look at the reward we get and where we end up in uh, at the next state. And we look basically at the maximum expected return that we can get from that next state. But why couldn't we look at multiple rewards that we get in a given trajectory and then cut the, uh, the trace only after multi-steps? Well, actually we can, that's called multi-step learning. This is only one version that is called n-step target. You can also have TD lambda, which basically uh, gives m uh, less and less importance to, uh, to the n-step targets um, uh, for, for, for bigger n, basically. Um, and when you do this, uh, you can get um, much uh, faster information about, um, about future rewards, right? But the thing is that you require online data for convergence without bias, right? Because you use, this is not anymore a, a enough policy um, uh, uh, update that will converge without bias. And one way to kind of uh, get the best of both worlds is you use n step targets with n relatively big at the beginning of the learning, and then you can decrease the n uh, through, through, through learning. That's one way to kind of try to get the best of both worlds. You get better stability and faster um, uh, kind of information update in your Q values. And by, at first by having a big N and then by decreasing N afterwards, you, you, reduce, you reduce the bias due to the fact that, that the, the data is not obtained uh, via the, the best uh, policy. Uh, always, at least some, usually with some epsilon greedy um, policy. Okay, so that's yeah, a question. Uh, just come back to the. Uh, just coming back to the important sampling question. Like here, you would need some important sampling because you take multiple actions with a different policy. Yes. So that 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 would be another way uh, to 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 kind of fix this this bias. It would be to try to uh, reweight. The, the rewards that you get, uh, so that you indeed, based on the behavior policy, you can still fit uh, a given uh, target that is different than the behavior policy. So that, that would be another way to do it um, and to keep a kind of end step learning with reweighting. Yes. Is that less common to do, you think, like with important sampling? Um, yeah, the thing is, important sampling also has some problems because it is high variance. If your behavior policy and your target policy are very different, these weights um, that you add kind of um, can become very big or very small, and you have a, a big variance in your target estimate. So basically, your target estimate might be uh, unbiased, but you will have uh, kind of sometimes it will look very low, sometimes look very very high. Right, and you try to fit kind of the expectation, but by learning from a high variance target, um, you you have some more difficulties, right, than having like directly the mean given to you for free. So it's one possibility, but it brings other uh, drawbacks. Right. Thanks. Sure. Other questions. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so instead of sampling state, action, reward, next state, you would sample basically this, but for n steps, right? So states, action, reward, next state, and then action at the next state, et cetera, until ne next step in the future. And you sample that from your replay memory, and you use it to calculate your target. You take the, all of the from the replay. Yes. So within a given trajectory, you will instead of only picking state action reward next state, you will, you will pick a broader part of the trajectory. Okay, but then they correspond to different features, right? Because when, when they are appended to the replay buffer, then we are using different features all the time, right? What do you mean by different features? Uh, uh, features, like the parameters. Theta? Oh, theta. So, um, so, so theta are the parameters of uh, the estimates of the Q values, and then for every, uh, like at least after n 
the, the, the nth state in your, in your small part of the trajectory, that's where you will estimate the Q values. And here you only use actually the rewards up to the nth state. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand. So here the, 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 the parameters theta are not dependent on, on exactly how many, n, how many n is there, right? So basically the Q network will be the same. It's just the target that is different based on the fact that you sample more than state action reward next state. And then based on the fact that your target here is different. So the theta are the same. Basically, that's why you can also start with an n-step target that is n quite high, let's say 10, and you can reduce n to maybe even one when you want to try to, con to converge without bias. So, and, and you keep the same Q network. It's just, it just the target update that is different. Okay. Okay, so another thing that you can use to improve, um, pro to improve uh, convergence is to use the discount factor. So I've already mentioned that a high discount factor um, makes it more difficult to converge. Usually, you want it to be as high as possible, right? Because for instance, in Atari games, if you care about the sum of rewards, basically until you die in the game, uh, actually you would want your discount factor to be even one. But when you're trying to learn with a very high discount factor, uh, it is very difficult to make the deep Q networks work. And uh, basically, that's why you use the discount factor smaller than one. And what you can do uh, is to start with a lower discount factor and increase it through learning. And this is also similar to um, maybe uh, how animals and humans would learn. Uh, so there are empirical studies of cognitive mechanisms that uh, says that only children uh, starting from ages three or four are able to maximize the rewards uh, after 10 or 15 minutes, right? Before three or, or four AG, uh, uh, years old, children tend to just maximize their very immediate rewards, very myopic uh, kind of policy, right? And only when you get older and uh, have gathered more information about the world, you are able to kind of try to optimize your horizon uh, you are trying to optimize your objective for a longer horizon. And so this is slightly similar in, in deep Q networks. If you directly set your discount factor, for instance, at 0 0.99, you have a learning uh, in this game of Qbert that is relatively slow, and you also see some instabilities here in the v-value function. So here, the v-value function is calculated as the uh, mean estimated v-value function through the trajectories you go through, and you see that it actually over, somehow over, overshoots and then goes back down towards something that looks like more or less convergence, but there are still a lot of things happening because the score is still increasing. But you know, it, it looks like here, the expected return should be better than here, at least from the Q values that are learned. But in, in reality, uh, this, is, this is not the case, right? Uh, so basically you have a lot of instabilities, a lot of overshooting, you try to learn from relatively few, few data and a high discount factor and things go not so well. If you use a discount factor that starts with a relatively low value, for instance, 0 0.95, and you increase it to a discount factor of about 0 0.99, the learning is much quicker and you have a much more stable uh, learning of the value function as well. Uh, so that's also one thing you, you, can, you can play with is the discount factor at training time. Of course, at, not of course, but at test time, you usually still have a non-discounted return, right? So here, the score that is written here is just the sum of rewards over your episodes until you die, non-discounted. But at training, you use a discount factor and you can play with, uh, with the scheduling of this discount factor, okay? So still another trick that you can be interested in is dueling networks. Uh, so the, the idea is not to directly learn the Q values, but actually learn two different objects of interest within your Q network, which are the ad advantage function here and the v-value function here. And the advantage function is defined as being um, the difference between the Q-value function and the v-value function, right? And by kind of uh, having some, some parameters theta that are shared between your V components and your 
advantage components and by merging afterwards your V value estimates and your advantage function estimates into the Q value function estimates, you can kind of enforce that within your learning, you learn the V value function and the advantage function. So that's called dueling network. It gives you slightly more information directly available in your network. Um, and uh, it can also somehow, in some context, improve learning. Okay. Yes, question. Uh, for the previous one, uh, with the adaptive um, discounting rate, yes. is the V here the estimate of the value with the discounting, or what, how is it calculated? So this, is, this light blue um, line is um, the V value function uh, averaged over the states that are uh, visited when uh, in, in the test trajectories. So basically, while your score is uh, this one, your discounted expected return was estimated to be this one. Right? So basically, you are even, you are est oh, clearly overestimating your true return, even, even though you are discounting it. So you so you 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 take your rollouts at test time, where you try to calculate the score that is uh, non-discounted. So you just sum the rewards, and at the same time, you look at the um, Q values that are estimated from your Q network, um, and you kind of look at these values and you average the V values. So basically, the max of the of these Q values over your trajectories at test time. So does that improvement come from the fact that? With a low discount factor, we, have, we don't have overestimation anymore. Yeah, basically, indeed. So you see two, two things. You see that the, the score increases faster. And you also see that the expected return estimated, so your V value function or via the Q values, via, via the Q network, that are estimated are lower. And basically, it seems that they are clearly um, much more in line with what you expect. Because here you clearly have some overshooting of the of the estimations, while here it seems that it is actually learning uh, something very close to the k true optimal Q values for that given discount factor. So for a given time step, for instance, 0 0.97 gamma, you get this estimated of the expected return given by your Q network, and this seems much more in line with what you what you actually expect without uh, overestimations. And basically, this leads to, to faster learning. And in the end, in the end, you are still interested in having uh, a high discount factor. Right? Because if you, if, you skip, uh, if you keep a low discount factor, like 0 0.95, for instance, you have a high bias in your learning. Right? You're optimizing something that you do not actually care about. You're optimizing the immediate rewards, while there are maybe policies that are better with long horizon. Um, so another thing that, um, that is important is to fight overfitting and lack of plasticity in, in deep learning. Um, and this comes, um, the, the, the problem starts from the fact that in your replay memory, you sample many times the same tuples, right? And because of that, there is a risk of, um, first of all, forgetting the, the past, everything that is not in your replay memory anymore, you have a risk of, over, of forgetting it, right? Because you no, do not sample it anymore. And you kind of overfit on what is in, currently in your replay memory. And the second risk is that you have a lack of plasticity. So it's been shown that uh, when, you, when you learn, for instance, different tasks, one after the other, at some point, your neural network is not able to learn anymore, right? Because it kind of takes some um, in the manifold, the parameters take a given, given values, and then it, it gets difficult to get uh, the gradient and all the all these, um, all the, 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 the Q updates to work correctly. Um, so you have a lack of plasticity as well. And some solutions to, to fight this catastrophic forgetting and this lack of plasticity is uh, resetting some layers to random initialization. So it feels like a really brutal approach, right? Because you're kind of erasing completely the information you have been learning for at least some of the layers. But it can actually help. 
And you can also try some specific activation functions to try to deal with this. Uh, you can basically also play with all the hyperparameters of your deep Q network. You can play with the replay ratio, like try to, to get a bigger replay memory as well or something like this. But uh, these two are, are also uh, two solutions. Um, yes, question. So is this problem with the overfitting and then not changing anymore the weights uh, typical for offline situations or also on polyphasy algorithms or reinforcement learning algorithms will face the same issue? Um, this is, um, yeah, most of them would, would also occur if you use something else than Q learning. Um, yeah. So basically it's more related to the fact that yeah, you have, you have a limited data set that you currently keep in your replay memory, right? And because of that, if you resample too much from that, you, we, you will only fit that, right? And when you actually overfit in, in, uh, in deep Q networks, you also increase the potential problems with actually not converging at all. So, so like divergence and overfitting are also, uh, are also uh, related. And then the lack of plasticity is if you, are, if you are learning too much on some specific data, and then you need to change kind of the target for new tasks, et cetera, it becomes difficult. Yeah, thank you. Oh, hello. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, why is overfitting bad in reinforcement learning? Because in supervised learning, we normally overfit to the training data set. Yes, so, so, so you, you can, somehow overfit, right? But if you overfit too much, whether it, for, even in supervised learning, if you overfit too much, your actual generalization on a test set that is different than the training set will get worse, right? So this problem of overfitting is definitely also present in supervised learning. And in reinforcement learning, um, in addition to kind of overfitting and maybe lack, a lack of generalization, you might also have problem of convergence actually. Because if you are not able to estimate accurately the Q values at the next state, uh, the max of the Q values at the next state uh, correctly, then maybe you can also propagate some errors due to this overfitting. Okay. Other questions, yes. Uh, yeah, so my question is regarding resetting the layers. Um, so you're saying it helps learn stably, but like when you're resetting the weights of your layers, are you not going to see a drop in performance yes. immediately? And wouldn't that like hurt your whatever application that you want to use it for? Yes, yes. So, so indeed, when you reset the, the weights, at that point it gets worse, but then you keep training, and then you kind of get something that, that that's the potential to get even better than if you did not uh, reset in the first place. But indeed, at the time where you reset, it will most likely lead to something worse R right after. But then you, you keep training. Yes? Um, yes, the resetting of the layers, do you also reset the target network? Or do you keep like, the same target network? Um, so. Um, so usually, like, this reset of the, of the weights will, will kind of propagate in the target network, right? But uh, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. Are you like yeah, you 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 can you can keep the target network at first the same and resetting only the one that you kind of update instead, but then at some point you will also kind of have the effect that is translated into the target network. Uh, you mentioned some specific activation caution can help. Can you mention how that? Um, yeah. So, like the the idea is to make sure that you do not. Um, you do not get some, some activations that are, um, for instance, with ReLU, with ReLU activation function, you can easily get activations that are zero, right? And through training, you will may, maybe get something that is sparser and sparser. So at least I can give you a counterexample that is easy to understand. ReLU is not always ideal in reinforcement learning, specifically in this kind of more continual learning scenario, right? And so you can try to have like some other activation functions that have better properties, or some regularization of the weights. Or... So it's kind of still a, a very kind of 
research area. Yes. Uh, can you give some intuition why resetting some player would help to learn? More yes. So, so, so basically, the, the, the idea is that um, at some point, something more, more or less bad kind of happens in, in the learning. And then by resetting, you kind of give, again, this, this, um, this plasticity, so this ability to learn new things to your neural network. So that's the idea. You kind of reset it to initial weights that are kind of um, nice to, to learn new things. Right, it's a, you can think of it as, you know, you have kind of really fitted everything and then basically maybe, for instance, the gradient cannot flow anymore through the weights because it's kind of has converged somehow to a local minimum and every new thing that you try to make it learn will kind of fail. And then you reset the weights so that you start from a new uh, function approximator from which it is easier to learn. So you mean maybe like uh, when it's arriving some local minima and then when you recess some layer, it basically jumped into some other landscape of the loss? Yeah, you, yeah you, 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 change, you change your, your, theta param your, your parameters of your neural network, right? At least for some parts of the vector theta. And basically that indeed brings you to um, basically another, another um, place of your function approximator. So the outputs of your function approximator for a given state action pair will be different. And then you will learn from there. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the logic, the, which logic exactly? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, that 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 might help. Um, that 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 that's definitely something to try. The thing is, reducing again the discount factor will maybe not affect the plasticity, like the ability to learn new things from your neural network. Um, but it might be that somehow in the optimization process that helps. Yeah, but at least uh, it's some, some, something maybe to think about. But at least for like starting from a lower discount factor because you have less data, um, more risk of instabilities at the very beginning of the learning, et cetera. Um, and then true learning increase the discount factor so that in the end you decrease the bias. This is kind of relatively logical from a machine learning point of view and even from the motivation from neuroscience. Uh, trying to reduce the discount factor, increase it again, uh, that, that might have other motivations, but yeah. Something to try. Uh, another question. Uh, you said that the problem is overfitting to replay buffer. And uh, what if we just rather change the data in replay buffer? Like maybe it's more promising. Yeah, yeah indeed. So, so another, another way to kind of try to somehow tackle these two problems is, for instance, reduce the replay ratios. So basically, you try to gather more data and learn less let's say from any data that comes in the replay buffer, but then you become less sample efficient. So that means you need more tuples from the environment to learn. But indeed, well, the, 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 one, one reason also why we have these two problems, it's not really the only one, but it's because we replay several times the same tuples, right? And if we replay them too many times, then we, we make these problems worse. Yeah, if, if you have a better uh, exploration ex uh, policy to gather data in your uh, replay um, memory, that definitely helps. Yeah, sure. So that's indeed something I do not cover here. I think there will be talks also on exploration. But yeah, indeed, uh, you can only learn from the data that gets into the replay buffer. And in deep Q networks, that's actually something I might not have mentioned, but uh, it uses uh, an epsilon greedy policy. So, so basically, epsilon percent of the time, you take a random action. One minus epsilon percent of the time, you follow what is currently thought to be the best policy, right? Uh, but if you have something that's smarter than this, then maybe you collect more interesting tuples, and then the learning is better. OK, 
so let's see. Okay, so it, the official time is over, but I guess I have more or less 15 minutes left. Uh, 15 minutes left. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so another technique than Q-learning is distributional DQN. Uh, so instead of trying to fit uh, the Q-value function, uh, you could, uh, and basically the Q-value function gives for a one state action pair, it gives you the expected return, right? It gives you basically one number. For a given state and a given action, it gives you one number. Uh, that, that kind of uh, gives you the expected return. But you, you lose some information, right? This does not give you information about the whole distribution of return. When you are in that given state, and you take a given action and then follow a given recipe pi, uh, the expectation gives you only one number and it does not cover the full distribution of the returns, right? And there are techniques um, that actually aim at learning directly this full distribution of return. Uh, basically, you get something that is similar to the Bellman iterations, but uh, for, from a distributional nature. So you need to look at uh, here the, uh, the full uh, random variable of the reward and the full random variable uh, of the um, expected return from the next time step onward. And from that, you can do the updates. Um, and basically, if you do this, and one, one nice thing, so basically there are maybe two, two nice things with this distributional, distributional Q-learning. First thing is that you can have risk-aware behavior. So if you actually care about is, for instance, never having a return lower than zero, well, by looking at the full distribution of return, you can select a policy that is maybe not the best in expectation, but one that makes sure you will never take a policy that will get maybe only 1% of the time a very bad return, right? And you can, so basically, implement some risk-aware uh, behaviors. Uh, so that, that's one thing you can get from this distributional DQN. And one other thing uh, that you get from it, in many cases, is that you can get more performant learning. Uh, because basically, you try to fit the whole distribution of returns, uh, and you have um, some problems that are slightly less um, uh, problematic than in DQN. Let's say it that way. Um, and you can also kind of relate this to the effect of auxiliary tasks. So basically, you learn something that is more informative. You learn the full uh, distribution of returns instead of only the expectation. And by learning something that is more informative, you might also help the learning, basically. OK, but basically, in practice, uh, that, that, that works well. OK. Um, and so some state-of-the-art results from the past years. So in 2015, uh, there was the, these deep Q networks. And then um, uh, here, it's on the benchmark that is uh, the 100K uh, Atari benchmark. Um, and you see that uh, you need it about more than 6 million, uh, more than 6 million, so because it's time 100K, more than 6 million steps to reach some kind of metric that, that, is corresp that corresponds to human level uh, with DQN. And nowadays, with, most of, with many of the tricks that I've discussed um, uh, today, uh, this paper managed to, 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 to get to about uh, 100K um, uh, steps needed for human level performance. Um, and the ones that are in blue, are actually combining model-based and model-free. Uh, so I will, if time permits, I will give a, a very small information about all the model-based, but we will have, you will have more information about model-based techniques in other talks. Um, maybe some real-world examples. So um, you have this, um, this example where they use deep reinforcement learning to, to make a stratospheric balloon navigate. So for instance, uh, here you see that at a given altitude, the wind tends to go in that direction. And at another altitude, the wind tends to go in that direction. So depending on where you want to land, well, you can kind of um, go higher in the, in the sky so that you go in the direction you want. And then you can go down more or less slowly, faster. Uh, and, and that way, you can kind of decide 
the trajectory that you will get for your stratospheric balloon. And this, kind, this problem has been um, tackled with, with reinforcement learning. Other types of problems that, that can be tackled with reinforcement learning is um, the, the optimization of the, of, of, the, of the control of microgrids. So let's say you have a microgrid that is connected to the grid with some solar panels, some loads, some uh, storage systems. Uh, by learning from trial and error, you can also, via deep reinforcement learning, uh, manage to, um, to learn, uh, for instance, if you have short-term storage with batteries and long-term storage with hydrogen, you can try to make the best uh, of these storage devices. Um, so you can use uh, here uh, to us use convolutions to treat the time series. Recurrent neural networks is also an option. Uh, and basically what you see is that as compared to naive policy obtained here for some sizing of your microgrid, uh, with deep reinforcement learning solutions, you get better results and you are getting close to the optimal that is if you actually knew everything from the future, right? And here, the green line as compared to the two other ones is when you can provide, in addition to the past observations, when you also provide some solar prediction to your neural network and then your neural network, without knowing that it is solar prediction, can kind of make use of that information to estimate the expected return and from this estimation of the expected return, get the best policy. So the more information you give, uh, usually if it's really informative features, uh, will allow your reinforcement learning algorithm to learn better. Um, okay, any questions on these real world examples? No? Okay, then we have some um, remaining slides that I will try to cover relatively quickly about improving further generalization in deep reinforcement learning. So here we have mainly covered model-free deep RL. Um, and what you, what you want usually in reinforcement learning is really to improve generalization. So learn from as few samples as possible, right? And what you can do for that is look at an abstract representation that discards non essential features, either by feature engineering or by some automatic methods that will do um, abstract presentation learning. You can modify the objective function. So we, talk, we talked about the tuning, the training discount factor. You can also have some kind of reward shaping. So if you are able to provide faster feedback about what the right action is, basically to simplify a lot what reward shaping is, it's better to provide the reward as soon as possible to your agent because it gets easier for the learning. Um, then you have also the learning algorithm. We looked a little bit at type of function approximators. We looked mainly at model free, but in some context, model based can also be uh, very interesting. And as was also mentioned in one of the questions, uh, whenever you can improve the data set, so basically the way you explore your environment, um, well, uh, that, that's something uh, you should always think about. It's not only about how you learn, but also from what you learn, right? The data set is also obviously very important. Um, so now um, I will talk a little bit about combining model-based and model-free and also the importance of abstract representations. So in, in cognitive science, there is a dichotomy between two modes of thought. So animals and humans are kind of described to be thinking in, let's say, two different ways. There is a system one that is kind of fast and instinctive, and that is related more to value-based learning and policy-based learning. Uh, because from the values, the Q values, and from the policy, you can directly act in the environment. So it's kind of very fast. It does not require a lot of thinking. And then you have a system two that animals and, and humans have that is slower and more logical, where you kind of look at, right? If I do this, this is what's going to happen, and then I will be able to do this. Or when you do some proofs in mathematics, right? It's kind of, you need, you need a, 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 to, to, to look at to see whether you arrive at the objective that, that you want. It's not fully instinctive, right? Um, so basically, there is a dichotomy. And in, in reinforcement learning, we can somehow also relate this dichotomy that appears in, um, that is described in cognitive science with the model-free and model-based approach. So the model-based, for instance, usually is used together with planning. And this can be related then to, um, to, to the system two uh, approach. Okay, um, then we have the choice of the learning algorithm and function approximator, but we have uh, more or less covered this already. 
Uh, so maybe one last thing before the questions is the importance of the abstract presentation. So in our deep learning, you have this, um, this structure of an encoder that can reduce the complexity of the input into a latent or abstract representation. One technique to learn this representation is the autoencoder framework, where you try to rebuild uh, the input at the output, and then you can use this latent representation as an abstract representation. So that's one way to do it. Uh, in reinforcement learning, using autoencoders has been used somewhat successfully, but there are other techniques that really make use of the dynamics of the environment to shape the abstract representation beyond pixel similarity, because uh, autoencoder techniques really look at pixel similarity. For instance, if the background of your environment changes, you will uh, probably take this information as the most important one with an autoencoder framework, while if you use other kind of techniques, you can get, for instance, these results. So here, if you are in a maze where your agent can go up, down, left, right, well, you can get an abstract representation that kind of looks like this, where in only 2D, so basically you have two neurons for your abstract representation, you can get something that kind of is much more uh, natural, where uh, you can really see the meaning of the action up. Well, here actually uh, there is some rotation, so it's not actually up this action, but you, you get the idea, right? So basically here you can really see the meaning of uh, the, all the different actions. Okay, so that's uh, abstract representations in reinforcement learning can also really make use of the dynamics of the environment um, to, to, to shape uh, as well as possible the representation. And for instance, in this catcher environment, you can get something that looks like this, where you can also get uh, basically the three features of importance. So for instance, here you have the position x, y of the ball and the position x of the paddle, and you can kind of retrieve this information in, a, um, in an abstract representation as well. Um, and then you can also do planning. Uh, idea, uh, ideally, you would also do planning in the latent space representation, such that planning is efficient and generalized as well. So basically, you start from x at zero, that is your abstract representation uh, after the encoder uh, in, the, in the reinforcement learning setting. And then you expand the most likely interesting actions based on your Q network, for instance up to a given planning depth, D, and then you back up this information that make use of both the planning and the estimates of the Q values into your current state. And with this, you kind of combine the information taken from a model and the information uh, taken from your Q values. Okay, so I guess now we can go on to the conclusions and potentially questions. So we looked at Q learning in a tabular case. Q learning with deep learning and the deep Q networks algorithm. We looked at different variants of model free DPRL, some real world examples, and then uh, we'll uh, give some links with other talks in the week uh, about model based and representation learning. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically here you can see that like going for instance, so here you have the, all the blue crosses corresponds to states of the agent that are on the left, right? And you can see that going all the time in a given direction will always increase, for instance, one of the features. So basically you can really understand what a given feature means and what a given action mean, means. Yes. Uh, so question about learning representations. So what do you think about pre-training the learning representations versus learning with the reinforcement learning parts? What are the pros and cons in this aspect? Yeah, so, so learning with autoencoders can be very stable and is kind of well understood, etc. cetera, but uh, the drawback uh, is that it's based on the pixels values, right? While potentially if you look at other techniques, you can, um, 
really forget about what takes most space in pixel space, but only look at what is important for the dynamics and even for the rewards that you are trying to optimize. So it can be even task-specific representation. Uh, while you cannot have this, if you, if you pre-train fully based on only states that you obtain in your environment and you do not look at the dynamics itself, then you, you, you lose some information that might be useful for the abstract representations. Okay, so if there is no more questions, I think we can stop here and go to lunch. Uh, thank you very much, Vincent. Thanks.